Beautiful day out there. Thank you for uh, joining us here today. Um, this gives me great pleasure to introduce you to two thought leaders who actually um, inform, inspire, and shape my own thinking about the relationship between technology and society on at least a weekly basis. And I'm not kidding. Um, it's really fantastic to have Yad, Ravan, and Joe Ito here with us for an hour and a bit. Um, to talk about the big topic, AI and society. Iyad is an associate professor at the MIT Media Lab where he leads the um, Scalable Cooperation Group, among other things. He has done really amazing work over the past couple of years looking at the interplay between autonomous systems and society, how these systems should interact with each other. Uh, he recently published a study in Science that got a lot of press coverage uh, addressing the question whether we can program moral principles into autonomous vehicles, and maybe he will uh, talk a bit more about that. And then, of course, Joe Ito, uh, director of the MIT Media Lab, a professor of practice, a person who doesn't really need an intro, so I'll keep it extremely brief. Um, just by highlighting two of the must-reads from uh, recent month, once um, is an interview that he had a conversation actually with uh, President Obama in the Wired magazine on the future of the world, uh, addressing also AI issues among other topics, um, and his book, Whiplash, which is somehow a survival guide for the faster future that we're all struggling with. I highly recommend it as, as a reading. I greatly benefited from it. Uh, so, these are not only two amazing thought leaders, but they're also wonderful collaborators and, and colleagues. And uh, I have the great privilege, together with the Berkman Klein team, to work with both of them as part of our recently uh, launched joint venture, um, the AI Ethics and Governance Initiative. And so, it's just wonderful to have you here and uh, spend some time with all of us and share your thoughts. So, thank you very much and welcome. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Urs. Uh, first of all, some of you may be here wondering, wait, this wasn't the talk that I signed up for. Uh, so let, to just give you sort of the provenance of this. Originally, I think there was a book talk that I was going to do with Berkman, and then I said, oh, well, why don't we bring somebody else interesting in? Joshua Ramo, who wrote Seven Cents, joined. Uh, we were going to have a dialogue about his book and my book. And then uh, he had a family emergency, couldn't make it. I grabbed Iyad uh, and also realized, just as uh, um, Urs was saying, we're doing a lot of work together with the Berkman Center on AI and society. And I thought this would be a sufficiently relevant topic to what we were going to talk about anyway, so it wouldn't be that much false advertising. Um, and it was a, it, it's sort of, a, uh, I think, an idea that relates to my book as well. Um, one, I can't remember who it was, but a well-known author told me, when you give book talks, don't like explain your whole book because then no one will have to buy it. And so, so this book actually started about four years ago, and we were just wrapping it up as we saw a lot of this AI uh, society controversy slash interest start. So the book sort of ends where our exploration of AI and society begins. And so, in a way. Um, it uh, overlaps what the book is about, but, but is, is, is sufficiently different that you have to read the book in order to understand the whole story. Um, <clears throat> but let me, I'll just start a few remarks. We'll have Yad present some of his work, and then we'll have a conversation with all of you. And feel free to interrupt um, and ask questions or, or disagree. Uh, I think the, the uh, so I, I co-taught a class with Jonathan Zittrain uh, in January in the winter semester on um, and his traditional course that he teaches called Internet and Society. I think it's the Politics and Technologies of Control. Bruce Schneier was there, others were there. It was a fun class. But one of the, the sort of framing pieces of how we talked about this was this sort of Lessigian picture that many of you may have seen in his book, where you have law at the top, and then you have uh, markets on one side, you have norms on the other, and you have technology underneath, and that you have you in the middle. And somehow what you are able to do is determined by sort of this relationship between law, technology, I think technology is on top and law is down here, but anyway, but, but somehow these all affect each other. So you can create technologies that affect the law, you can create laws that affect norms, you can create norms that affect technology. So, so some relationship between 
norms, markets, law, and technology is how we need to uh, be thinking <clears throat> in order to design all of these systems so that they work well in the future. And I think one of the key reasons why I think the collaboration with between MIT and, 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 and Harvard Law School, Media Lab, and Berkman is so important is that <clears throat> you kind of have to get all the pieces and the people in the same room because the problem is once everybody has a solution and they're trying to convince each other of the solution, <clears throat> it's, I, I call them people selling dollhouses rather than Legos. And what you want is you want a, a whole pile of Legos with lawyers and business people and technologists and, and policymakers playing with the Legos rather than trying to sell each other on their own um, Dollhouse, and that, that was sort of what was fun with the class, <coughs> was that I think a lot of lawyers realized that actually, in fact, whether you're talking about Bitcoin or differential privacy or AI, we still have a lot of choices to make on the technology side. And in fact, those can be informed by um, policy and, and law. And conversely, I think a lot of the technologists thought that law was something like laws of physics that just are. But in fact, laws are the result of lawyers and, <coughs> and policymakers talking to technologists, think, imagining what society wants. And so, so, so we're sort of in the process right now of, um, of, of, of struggling through um, how we think about this. But importantly, is it's already happening. So it's not like we have that much time. I think it was Pedro Domingo in his book, that's Domingo's Who Says uh, in Master Algorithm, and this isn't the exact, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm paraphrasing the quote, but it's something like, I'm less afraid of a superintelligence coming to take over the world and more worried about a stupid intelligence having taken over already. You know? <clears throat> and, and I think that's you know, very close to where we are. I mean, I think if you see uh, uh, Julia Angwin's uh, um, pa paper article in ProPublica, I guess it was a little over a year ago, where she shows this, uh, she finds a, happens to find a district where um, they are a lot, they're forced to disclose um, the court records. Uh, and so she was specifically going after the fact that machine learning, <clears throat> AI, is now used by um, the judiciary to set bail, to uh, do parole, and even um, sentencing. And they have this thing called the risk score that the machine sort of pops out after it does an assessment of the person's history, looks at their um, interviews. Um, and uh, she found, and you, this is great, because she's a, she's a mathematician and a data scientist. She crunched all these numbers and shows um, that in many cases for um, white people, it's sort of nearly random in some cases, right? So it's, it's, it's a number, but it's still almost random. And then for um, black people, it's biased against them, right? And what's interesting is when I talked to, I talked to a, 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 a um, prosecutor the other day, and he said, well, you know, I love, they love these numbers. He didn't say I, but in general, they love these numbers because you get a risk score that says, okay, this person has a risk rating of eight. And so then the, 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 the court can say, well, we will give you this bail. Because the last thing that, the, that they want is for them to give them some bail. The person goes out and then murders somebody. It's sort of their fault. But if they've taken the risk score and say, well, I, I, I just looked at the risk score, it absolves them of this responsibility. And so there's this really interesting question, which is even at random, it's still sort of they, there's this weird moral hazard where even though you have agency, you're able to push off this responsibility to the machine, right? And you can say, well, it was math, you know? And, and the problem right now is these algorithms are um, running on data sets and training systems that are closed. Um, we see this happening in a variety of fields. I think we see this happening in the judiciary, which is you know, a scary place for it to be happening. And so we're, we're go as part of this uh, initiative uh, with AI uh, fund that we're doing, we're going to try to look at whether we can create more transparency and auditability. We're also seeing it in, in medicine. You know, there's a, there's a, uh, a study that I heard uh, where uh, when the doctor overruled the machine in diagnostics, uh, the doctor was wrong 70% of the time, right? So, so what does that mean? So if you're a doctor and you know for a fact that you're 70% likely on average to be wrong, are you ever going to overrule the machine? What about the 30% where the doctors are right? You know, and so, so it creates a very difficult situation. And you look at, imagine war, right? So we have, you know, uh, they, we talk about autonomous weapons, and, we're not, and there's this whole fight about it. But what if all of the data, what if, not what if, in fact, all of the data, a lot of the data that's driving intelligence, when you get, the way that you get onto a, on the termination list, the list that, as a target, 
A lot of it involves statistical analysis of your activity, your emotions, your calls. And there's this great uh, interview, I think it was in the Independent or with the Inter Intercept. I think it was Independent. It was this guy who, uh, I think he was in Pakistan. I'm going to get this wrong, I, I'll, but it's close. <laughs> but, but had been attacked a number of times where the collateral damage was family members being dead. So he knew he was on the kill list, but he didn't know how to get off. So he goes to London to kind of fight for, wait, look at me, talk to me. You know, I'm on this kill list, but I'm not a bad guy. Somehow you got the wrong person. But there's no interface in which he can sort of lobby and petition for getting off this kill list. So, so even though the person controlling the drone strike and pushing the button may be a human being, if all of the data that's feeding into, or a substantial amount of the data that's feeding into the decision to put the person on the kill list is from a machine, I don't know how that's that different from the machine actually being charged. So, so we talk about sort of these future autonomous systems and robots running around killing people as a scary thing. But if we are just pushing the button that the robot tells us to do, pick A, B, C, or D, but the robot says it's C, you're going to push C, right? I mean, apparently that was how um, uh, Kissinger controlled Richard Nixon. Was, it was always, the answer was always C. Um, but anyway, the, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, that, that actually is, when we think about practice, um, we may already be in autonomous mode on many things. And so, um, and then I'm going to sort of t tee up to um, Yad, which is, I think one of the first places that where the rubber meets the road, literally, is with autonomous vehicles. And, you know, a lot of the p people that I talk to say, well, the real soul searching around this is going to happen when um, the, the next big autonomous vehicle accident happens where it's clearly the machine's fault. How is that going to play out? So that may be one of the things. But one of the, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say is that I do think, and this is where the Media Lab is excited, is I think it's kind of an interface design problem because part of uh, what the problem is is you may think that pushing the button, the right to push the button, the right to overrule the computer, the right to launch the missile may be your finger. If you have no choice, morally or statistically, other than to push the button, you're not in charge anymore, right? And so what I think we need to think about is how do we bring society and humans into the decision-making process so that the answer that de we derive involves human beings? And, um, and how, how does that interface happen? What is the right way to do it? Because I think what we are going to end up with is collective decision-making with machines. And what we want to not be in is um, human agency with no real decision-making ability. Um, and then we can talk more about some of the ideas, but I'm, I'll hand it over to Yad. Thank you. So I'll just uh, give a sort of short overview of uh, the research that we've been, we've been doing on autonomous vehicles. And, um, you know, I'm not a, a driverless car expert. I don't build driverless cars. Um, but I, I'm interested in them as kind of a social phenomenon. And the reason has to do with, uh, with this dilemma that people keep discussing that, you know, what if it's an, uh, an autonomous car is going to, uh, for some reason, uh, harm a bunch of pedestrians crossing the street because the brakes are broken or because they jumped in front of it or whatever. Um, <clears throat> but the car can swerve and kill uh, one bystander on, uh, on the other side in order to minimize harm, in order to save, let's say, five or 10 people? Should the car do this? And, and who should decide? And uh, more interestingly, uh, sh what if the car could swerve and hit a wall harming the passenger uh, and killing the passenger in order to save these people? Should the car do this as well? What does the car have a duty towards? Uh, minimizing harm, utilitarian principle, uh, protection of the owner or the passenger in the car, a uh, duty towards them, or something else, or some sort of negotiated outcome in between. And, you know, do we ignore this problem? Do we just say, well, let the car makers uh, deal with this problem? And it seems to be a very, you know, uh, uh, controversial topic because um, there are lots of people who love this and lots of people who hate this. And people who hate it say, well, this is not, never going to happen. Um, it's just, uh, so statistically unlikely, and I think that kind of misses the point because this is a you know it is, this is a an in in vitro you know ex exploration of a of a principle. Uh, so you strip away all of the things that don't matter in the real world so that you can isolate a factor. You know, does 
drug X cause you know, this particular uh, reaction in a cell, for example. You, you, know, you don't do this in, in the forest, you do it in, uh, in a petri dish. And this is the petri dish for studying human perception of, of machine ethics and what are the factors that people seem to be ticked off by. Um, and I think, you know, when we started studying this, we, we used the uh, uh, techniques from social psychology. We frame these problems to people. We vary things, the number of people who are being sacrificed or otherwise, whether it's an act, act of omission versus act of commission and things like this. And we're sort of interested in, you know, how do people want to resolve this dilemma? But what's fascinating is that we, there was something that's so obvious that we missed initially, which is that this is not really a, an ethical question. It's more of a social uh, a dilemma. It's a, so, it's a question about how you negotiate the interests of different people. And this was the strongest sort of finding that we, we found, which is that no one wants to be in a self-sacrificing car, but they want the whole world to be to drive once. And, and it's really fascinating, and, and the effect is so, is so strong um, that, you know, if you look at, for example, the morality of sacrifice, and this is, you know, if you kill a pedestrian to save 10, kill a passenger to save 10, and so on, so you can see that uh, you know, I, I think it's moral and desirable in both my car and other cars to sacrifice other people, uh, you know, for the greater good. So I'm happy to kill pedestrians to, to say, you know, one pedestrian to save 10. That's great. But as soon as you tell me, well, you know, would you, um, would you sacrifice yourself? Would you sacrifice the passenger? Well, I think, you know, I think it's moral. I think it's great. But I would never want this in my car. Uh, not in other cars and definitely not in my car. Um, and this is where you see these things uh, split. Now, uh, this is the tragedy of the commons, right? I want public uh, safety to be maximized. I would like the world to be a safer place where the cars make the decisions that minimize harm, but I don't want to contribute to this public good. I wouldn't want to pay the personal cost needed to do this. Well, we thought maybe uh, regulation, you know, that's how public goods uh, problems are solved. You know, let's set a quota on the number of sheep that can graze so we, can don't, we don't have to over, overrun the pasture. Or let's set a quota on the number of fish you can catch so you don't overfish and kill all the fish and, and basically everybody loses out. And we asked people whether they would support this. And we found that um, people think it's moral, but they don't want it to be legally uh, enforced, at, at least for now. Right? This, is, this is a PR problem, and maybe, it's a, it's a, you know, maybe we need to develop the law so that people feel comfortable with what this means. Um, and, and I guess just to ask a question, because um, <clears throat> because we talk a lot about the evolution of cultural things, mm -hmm. and I assume all of these are people, I guess you don't know, but most of these are people who have ever, never been in a self-driving car, mm -hmm. right? And I think one of the things that we found, um, again, this is not my work, but um, some of our colleagues, uh, they did a self-driving car Uber-like thing where you get an app, but it was actually for normal, um, sort of the pub public. And their, uh, to your, sort of to your point, their impression about the safety of self-driving cars changed substantially after they had actually experienced it for a, a little while. And they felt, in sort of anecdotally, I felt safer than with dad. You know? And so, so I think that once you sort of are in a self-driving car and see how much control it has, your view on its safety as well as its, like, the, and the other thing that happens, and this may happen more in Japan and in the U.S., they, in, in, in Japanese culture, you often sort of personify and identify with machines and tools and things like that. So they start to feel trust with the machine, which I think unless you experience it, you don't, can't imagine it, you know, yeah. but anyway. I agree, I agree. So I think there's, there's, there's all sorts of things. You know, we're now interested in studying, for example, Agency perception, you know, do people perceive these things to have minds and, you know, and if not, then, then why not? What, what's the missing component? Um, which, is, which becomes really interesting with drones, for example. Um, so uh, the other thing is, you know, when, when we ask people, well, again, you know, this is people think it's, mo it's moral to sacrifice, but they don't want it to be regulated and they would definitely not buy it if it's regulated, but they're much more likely to purchase those cars if they were regulated. And I think this is really... Really, really important question, because if people don't purchase those cars, you will not save lives. I mean, you know, the, the, people estimate, you know, scientists are estimating that 90% of accidents today are due to human error. So if we could, you know, the, the sooner, if, assuming the technology will get there quickly, the sooner we uh, have wide adoption, the sooner we save more lives. But if the people are so worried about, you know, edge cases, um, or that their own safety is not paramount, 
they may not purchase the cars and we may not therefore uh, have wide adoption. And as a result, we, we kill and, more and people. And to map this onto the Lusigian quadrants, yes. this is a clearly one that you can't just leave up to the market. If people aren't buying the thing that they believe is, has a common good, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And if, you, and if you regulate it, then you kind of, there's a backfire effect, which is, well, fine, I, you know, that's great. That's a good social contract for other people, but I will continue to drive my own car and probably be more likely to kill myself as a result. So people are not uh, rational in the way they assess risk, for example, of getting on a plane or, you know, will I be hit, you know, eaten, eaten by a shark? People over, overestimate those risks. And there's a good chance that uh, if we don't trust those systems, then we will overestimate those risks too and, and prefer to drive ourselves. So, uh, so we have an ethical dilemma that we started from. Then we realize it's a social dilemma. But now we're realizing that the, there's a meta-ethical dilemma, which is if you, if you solve the social dilemma by using regulations, you may actually create a bigger dilemma, a bigger trolley problem, which is, you know, do we drive cars, do we continue to drive cars ourselves, or do we, do we lead um, to wide adoption, do we promote wide adoption of autonomous vehicles? So we want to collect more data. Uh, we want to understand um, uh, this issue in more nuanced terms. And we started, uh, when I move fast on this, uh, we started collecting data. Um, these things have made it to, to transportation regulations now or, or guidelines, which is good. But we've created a website called Moral Machine um, uh, in which we uh, randomly generate scenarios. So in this case, it's not just you know, one versus 10 or one versus five. It's, uh, a per, you know, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a dog in there, and we vary the ages of people. Sometimes they're children. Sometimes they're pregnant women. Sometimes people are crossing a red light, uh, so do they deserve the same level of protection? As, as and this is very interesting for this, uh, for this uh, uh, group here, uh, what if they're children? You know, do they, should they, are they expected to know that not to cross the red light? Um, so it gets really hairy really quickly. You know, these are still cartoons. They're still very simplified scenarios. Uh, but I think they, they still bring out lots of interesting questions. And we show people, you know, results. Uh, summer, this, is, this is a former postdoc of mine who has a cat. Um, he's, he's happy to kill babies uh, to save cats. And we also show people, we show people how much they care about different um, factors and how that compares with others. So, so people love this because um, they, it's kind of a mirror to their own uh, morality. You know, do I care about the law a lot? You know, and, and how do I compare with other people? Uh, uh, on this matter? Do I protect passengers more uh, than other people or less? Um, and so on. So we, we also have like this design mode where people can create their own uh, scenarios and, and uh, they get a, a link to them. And a lot of people have been using them in teaching ethics now in high schools and universities. Um, um, and, and we have all sorts of, you know, species preferences. Should so social value be taken into account? Um, should age be taken into account? And so on. Um, and we also vary whether there's an omission or commission distinction. You know, which action, the, the action that minimizes harm, is that an omission or a commission? And there is definitely bias in the data that we're, we're now analyzing. Um, so, so far, we've translated this to 10 languages. Uh, it's, we've received 3 million users have, have uh, completed more than 28 million decisions, like binary choices. Uh, and we have 300,000 full surveys. And this is growing, still growing fast. Um, and these full surveys allow us to tease out whether these people have cars themselves, which age, which age bracket, which income bracket they come from, and so on. And, and this is really, really interesting because you can start then saying, well, people who already have cars may be more or less likely to, uh, to support this particular ethical framework. Um, so we have a lot of global coverage. And so far, we've been looking at uh, cross-cultural differences. And because this is recorded, I don't want to talk about it yet. Basically, uh, we're observing some very interesting cross-cultural differences um, in terms of the degree to which people are utilitarian or to which uh, they would prioritize the passengers, to which they're willing to take an action, so omission versus commission, and so on. I think it's really fascinating, and it would be a very important precondition to any sort of um, public relations or uh, efforts to make the cars more acceptable, but also potentially to the, the legal uh, differences in the legal frameworks as well. Um, also look, beginning to look at uh, partial autonomy. So you know, whether it's autonomous cars or drones or judges making bail decisions, again, uh, you, know, you can have a machine do everything, or you can have a human do everything. 
So, uh, and in the car, you have things where the, there's a driver assistant. So, you know, the person is in control and the machine sort of watches over them. <coughs> so Toyota has been uh, promoting this model and other car makers as well. Uh, but also there is autopilot where the machine does the things and then the human has to kind of co keep an eye on, uh, again, whether it's a car or, uh, or anything else. And then you have full autonomy. And the question in here we're interested in is we're comparing these, these models and we're, we're investigating empirically whether people assign different degrees of blame and res causal responsibility depending on the control architecture, we can call it. You know, uh, if, if a person overriding uh, a, a decision made by a machine is different from a machine making, uh, overriding a decision made by a human, it, and it happens, um, again, this is now in submission, but it happens to really matter. So it really matters who you think is ultimately responsible and who's liable. And I think this is a psychological sort of input to potential legislations that will come up. Uh, come out to, uh, to deal with these uh, scenarios. So this is a broader picture that I like, which I think uh, Joey alluded to initially, which is that uh, there is a gap in between uh, where you know, you have on, one th on one side you have engineers who think everything is an engineering problem, you know, everything can be engineered away, and you have uh, uh, people from the humanities and social sciences who, who st study the nuances of human uh, behavior, but also who know how rules can get sort of abused and, and have a good sort of knack for this. You know, how do you, how do you ensure that you have a, a coherent system of ethics and values and checks and balances and so on? And I think that these sides um, often don't talk to each other. So uh, I think there's, there's a, a sizable community of uh, people who complain about, you know, who are very good at identifying problems um, and you know, violations of fairness and rights and so on in technology, but who don't have the tools to express these co objections in a way that a computer scientist can operationalize. Likewise, um, you have uh, machine learning and AI scientists who feel that you know, this, is, this is problematic, this, I, I can see that this has, can cause problems, this can violate some people's rights, but they don't, again, they don't have the intellectual framework to, uh, uh, to raise these issues in a way that, that you know, and, and in a way that humans and society can evaluate, right? So what we're hoping to do, and, and this is the part of the partnership between the Media Lab and uh, the Berkman Center, is that we, you know, Berkman is, uh, Berkman Center are, you know, kind of are from this side and they understand us, and, and we come from this side, from technology, but we work on interfaces, and we hope that uh, through this we would create a kind of frameworks, interesting frameworks, and this is, I think, where the, many of the interesting questions are. Um, so I think we're ready for um, okay. maybe a discussion and taking some questions. Yeah, and I, I guess the, the one other <coughs> part um, that I would add to this is uh, um, <coughs> uh, just one other you know, axis is going back to judiciary, but we can have this in cars as well, is on the one hand, I don't think anybody thinks that... Um, speeding tickets issued by speed cameras on the highway are, I mean, some people may not like them, but that, 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 that's uh, inappropriate use of machines, right? <clears throat> because it's really a fact. There's a speed that you're allowed to go, and a machine's probably more likely to accurately measure your speed than uh, a human eyeballing it, and probably more fair as well. Um, on the other hand, I don't think anybody um, believes that the Supreme Court decisions at least for now, should have really that much substantial role of, of, of machines, at least in the deliberation part. And so, so there's a spectrum, there's, a, there's, a, there's this thing where on the one end, where you're just establishing a fact, which is sort of the implementation of a law of which we're not even disputing the, the justice of it, to the Supreme Court, which is supposed to try to reflect the norms of the day in making determinations about laws. But then there's a continuum in between, right? So somewhere in the middle there, you have this this uncanny place where um, it feels like the machines have some influence, and where and I think what's kind of interesting is just about all of these hypotheticals that we have. There's one extreme where you do want the machines in charge. There's another extreme where you do want humans in charge, and those are actually not that those diffi that difficult. It's sort of this space in between, and and I think that's also why it's kind of an interface mm -hmm. problem. Is that it's 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 very unclear at how the human and the machine. Um, pieces, whether it's a societal thing or as an individual get, um, um, uh, get together. And, and so, so that's, again, it, it's, it's related to the autonomy question, but I think it's a, 
and, 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 and I guess on, on your point, it's sort of technology and is it ethics or morality? There's some sort of stack as well, and maybe everything to an internet person looks like a stack, so maybe that's my problem. And, and I think there's sort of like an interesting thought experiment, which is, you know, suppose that we, you know, I think we need, we need tools too. You know, it's not just a, a legal question. I think new kinds of tools and new kinds of data can, uh, and reliable data can make a big difference. So let's assume that um, we invented the cars and they started going on high speeds, but we didn't invent the radar that can actually m accurately measure speeds. So we relied on human guesstimation of speeds, uh, of your speed driving. So there's a per policeman standing and kind of eyeballing cars, and oh, that, looks, that looks like 120, right? Um, you, could, we, you could very well imagine that uh, under this scenario, you know, uh, if, uh, if policemen were discriminating against one particular group, they could maybe overestimate their, uh, the speed of, of people driving cars from that particular ethnic group and underestimate uh, the speed of other people. Uh, but somehow the tool solves this question because it makes the final, you know, uh, it's, it's recorded and, and, and it somehow becomes objective, it becomes a fact. And we haven't, you know, the, it's not disputable. So can we do something similar here? You know, what, what, would, say, what would that but, technology but I, look like? But I think that, that this is where it hits a slippery slope. So if you're doing the speed of car, it's, only, it's a very small number of data points that the machine is getting to guess your speed. But the risk rating... Um, to some people may seem very scientific, especially if they don't understand math and statistics. And so they may say, well, the machine said they have a risk rating of this. And actually in the forms, they never ask you your race. It just turns out that when you collect the data and you collect the questions, the result is biased against race. And, and so, so one of the, the, the questions of what's difficult is if you don't understand how these algorithms convert data into results. And, and this is the problem of the black box thing where a lot of the machines, and, and again, there's progress on making machines that can explain how they got to the decision, but a lot of the machines that we currently use have, are unable to describe how they got the number. They just give you the number, right? Do you, do you have so, so if I may pick up on that and ask a first question. So um, this question of the normativity of the autonomous systems and who makes the, where's the source of, of the norm? That, that seems to be a key question. And I'm wondering, picking up on your earlier description, whether we are on a particular trajectory by what you described. I think there are roughly three phases, right, that I've heard. One is, um, okay, we have these autonomous vehicles, and now it's a question for lawmakers and regulators, how do we apply existing norms? to these new technologies. Sometimes you need to update the regulations, which we see happening, you made a reference to that. But there is also a second phase, it seems, where it's, um, and your work informs that, I think, is can we somehow program some of the laws and values and rules into the, the systems themselves, um, so that the, the behavior is closer to what we have normative concerns ar uh, around as a society and as lawmakers and policymakers. Yeah. But then there is a potential third phase, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in your views whether that indeed is a trajectory in, in the area you study or more broadly potentially, that as you could envision a future where more and more data accumulates um, in systems like autonomous vehicles based on the rules we programmed them how to behave and now they learn how these rules are obeyed or not what the compliance compliance rate is and the like where suddenly the norm itself becomes computer or machine generated and and how do we feel about that because mm -hmm. that maybe inadvertently will get us closer to the other end of the spectrum that you're describing that the norms are no longer developed here and then somehow programmed into the system but at least the evolution of the norm happens within the automated and, and, system. Is and, that and, the trajectory? And I think you have to remember to tease apart the norms and the laws, right? So, so you know, my, one of my favorite says ones... The, says the engineer to the lawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, um, is <laughs> like, my favorite one is one of the um, charts that, that Iyad gave me, but I did this in Japan, but I could do it here. So imagine you have a car, and on your left there's a... The two motorcyclists on the left and on the right. The one on the left has no helmet, and the one on the right is wearing a helmet. And there's a helmet law. So the guy on the left is clearly breaking the law, completely um, disrespect for the law. So you have to swerve. Somebody jumps in front of your car, you have to swerve. Do you hit the guy without the helmet, or do you hit the guy with the helmet? The guy with the helmet is more likely to survive, but he's following the law. 
So who hits the guy without the helmet? So, so I did this at a Japanese car company. I won't say which one. And half the room raised their hand. I said, well, it's on, of course you go after the guy who broke the law, right? But this is, this is a very interesting normative question, right? So, so and, and, you know, and there's all these versions of it, like, do you run a red light if you're, you, you know? So, 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 so what's interesting, I think, and what a lot of Yad's work is trying to do is how do you train a machine to reflect the norms of that particular community in which it's serving. And it's also going to be diverse. So, so I, I often think about you know, my wife moving here from Japan. It took her a year to get used to the idea that you're fighting traffic, that you're not, like we always joke, you're not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. That's sort of a very Japanese way of thinking. So you're always trying to let people in and make sure that you know, people aren't upset at you. Here, so I was like, ah, you know, and, it's, it, and they don't, and, and so, but the car, that's trained in Boston won't be able to drain, drive in Japan, right? And, and that has less to do with the law and more to do with this kind of normative intent, right? And so there's a personality thing, I think. I, I guess there's another complication, which is that, um, I guess there's, there's two of them uh, that I want to discuss, but one of them is that um, we, the norms and the law are you know, always changing to keep up with, with how the world is changing, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, a country becomes poorer and then new norms come, come about, you know, it, it, it's, it's well known, you know, if there's like, a, the government uh, is no longer efficient, then people turn more to religion. And, and there's, there's something called compensatory control theory uh, that, looks, that tries to quantify this. So we're always changing our norms, uh, we're always changing our laws. And what's happening is that I, I guess now the, the complexity of the problem is increasing significantly. So. How do you keep, you know, is the, at what point does it become combinatorially impossible to have a law to, to regulate something? You know, like what if, I mean, we have like billions of possibilities just from, from the moral machine, you know, simple, you know, w just which combination of, of children and dogs and, you know, omission commission, law, breaking the law, and that's like a very simplified view. Um, then, and we already don't know, like, what, what law would, would cover, you know, would give you a, a function, basically, like, this is okay and this is not okay, um, from just these astronomical possibili uh, possibilities, and, let alone the norms as well. And, and, and again, if we had just self-driving cars, we would get rid of a whole bunch of the laws. There'd be no reason to have stoplights, the uh, complete stop at a, red, at a stop sign. I mean, all of these assume that you have actors that can't communicate with each other, right? And so, so and, and I think also the complexity increases to where if even if you create a law, like full stop at, 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 at a stop sign, you could design a car that stopped for just a split second and kept going, and there was a little uh, a, a dampener so that the person didn't notice that you stopped. I mean, there's like all these stupid ways that a machine could get around a lot of the laws. And so laws are sort of designed to be enforced against slow, somewhat stupid human beings. But if you have a very fast, complicated machine, then it, and, 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 and even things like regulatory things like this, uh, there was a great thread on the um, Epic mailing list about um, uh, the, uh, the Volkswagen um, thing. If it had been a machine, uh, AI, it probably would have still cheated the EPA thing, but uh, the, 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 the emissions thing, but would just have known that if the hood is left open and it's go, this person's there, that it's supposed to have low emissions. But if the boss is saying, I need to get to the airport in a hurry, it does it. And that, that you know, but you wouldn't be able to tell anymore because there aren't lines of code, right? It's just sort of, it's learning its environment. So, so it, it, it will be interesting how these machines deal with regulations and, and laws. Excellent. Christoph Graber, uh, what are your reflections on, on the relationship between law and these kind of norms of the system? Um, actually, I have a question. So if we look at, at the law uh, over um, the last 250 years, the paradigm of the law, the dominant par paradigm was, even in, in uh, common law traditions, that you have, uh, so to say, abstract rules that are applied in um, concrete cases. Now my question is whether we are now entering into a new paradigm where you have actually um, concrete cases that um, are statistically um, appreciated and uh, then are used to develop um, abstract principles that should then be uh, resolving typical cases. I, I, th I think that might be, that's a very interesting like uh, dichotomy I think. Uh, I, I think that we, it's kind of the, 
a moral imperative that is created by a new technological capability. So uh, this is how I think of it. So you know, you you start from a situation where you can deal with the abstract rule. You have the abstract rule: don't kill other people. You know, if they're following the law, if there's a zebra crossing, don't you know, don't run them over, and so on. And then. Uh, uh, there are all sorts of other scenarios that you could maybe approximate with the rules, but then if they don't fall under any of the rules, then you just call it an accident. We just call it a day. Everybody goes home, right? Um, this is because we, there's no way a human being could have known, uh, for example, um, or could have, could have reacted fast enough in time, and there's not even a way for us to find out what the human knew when exactly. And then all of a sudden, we invent a tool that can, in theory, record all of this information, so we know what the car knew a number of milliseconds before an accident, and it could have, we can start creating counterfactuals and so on. So I think, so this is kind of from, from the top down. So I think the, uh, there's pressure on making the rules more complex because we can no longer call it an accident. We have to specify if you knew, you know, if the speed of the, the, the processor clock is this much and the, the, the car, the sensor has this type of resolution and it, the car knew and it could have done something else, then, you, you know, then is the manufacturer liable? Um, and at one point, is the manufacturer no longer li liable because the speed of the machine just cannot possibly reliably swerve in time, right? So I think we're, we have more and more pressure to increase the complexity of the rules, the top-down rules, but at, at the same time, we, there are things we can't really observe, we can't anticipate. So we notice, for example, uh, through the interaction of cars in the real world that one car maker is, you know, one particular design of the shaft or whatever is causing, just, you know, slightly more deaths for cyclists, right? The positioning of the, of the radar is under, uh, you know, it, it, it has a trade-off, you know, maybe it's over, it, maybe there's a trade-off between how efficient you are at detecting pass, uh, pedestrians or other cars and maybe cyclists. And there's a parameter that you t tune, and it would, it would impact the relative risk of these people, maybe statistics. So this you can only find out through experimentation. So then, by, and, and li literally, right? But then you need, again, you need, you need a, an interface between you know, society and these systems, and maybe, maybe scientists. It's a new form of science. It's, what it's not completely new. Like, I was looking at the uh, seatbelt. Bruce actually was the one that inspired me, but I remembered something that he doesn't remember that he said, so I may have just made it up. But, um, but, but it was something about the role of seatbelts and the fact that seatbelts protected the driver but didn't really protect the environment, right? So, so I looked up the, 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 the number of pedestrian deaths with the introduction of seatbelts, and it was it was non insignificant. So you could, there was a noticeable uptick in sort of thousands of people, because you could imagine, you know, you wear a seatbelt, you you care less about um, like these days with with airbags. I see people taking a lot more risk than they would have without them. Huh? Motorcyclists also helmets. What motorcycles helmets? Okay. Uh, Adams is a uh, economist in the UK. Talks about this as a risk thermostat. Yeah. That as our environment gets safer, we take more risks. Yeah. And then this, you're talking about the knock-on effects to the yeah. environment. And, and, and so, 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 so that is really interesting because I don't think we had a conversation about how many pedestrian death increases we would be willing to take in order to save more drivers. And, and, and that there's a version of this. And, and I think that to your point about sort of this thing is I, th I think that when you, you have to sort of understand and think about how AIs are trained. ARs are trained by a bunch of engineers who go in there and they try to optimize for a particular thing, which is sort of a high level first principle value. And then they're feeding it particular data. So the, the, these data sets that are biased against certain races for judiciary, clearly they weren't thinking about it because they didn't test against that. They were testing against another variable, right? So, so what happens is that instead of making rules, what you're doing is you're creating um, sort of algorithms that are designed by people who are inputting sort of an order of priorities of high-level principles and optimizations. And so if you're forgetting to optimize for something that society cares about, you've created an algorithm that is sort of inconsistent with the norms of society. And I think what the, the problem right now is there's a lot of black box. Um, and this gets to the collaboration we're trying to do. A lot of the engineers are doing sort of these one-off bespoke 
uh, machines, and they can't even transfer it to the next engineer who comes to take over. And so, so the problem is that all of that's sort of black box, and it's not accountable. And I think that first is sort of transparency and auditability, but the second phase, I think, is how do we have these higher level conversations? Because we can now have the higher level conversation and say, do we optim how much do we care about motorcyclists that don't wear helmets? How much do we care about you know, this? And, and maybe you can't even do it as a negotiation. Maybe it's polling societies or watching how people behave. But, the, but it's, it becomes a very weird question. And I think that the training systems become sort of the, the re not a replacement, but often are the proxy for laws, which are the way that we humans try to take these first principles and to try to create incentives to then reinforce those principles. Uh, hi, so, uh, sure, uh, I'm J.M. Porup, I'm a journalist. Um, if I could just zoom out just for a second, one thing that I try to do is look for useful metaphors to discuss these ideas with non-technical people. Um, and a, a metaphor uh, that, that this discussion provokes for me is a sports metaphor in terms of refereeing. what metaphor? Uh, sports. Like, well, let's take World Cup soccer. Uh, I can imagine a near future where you could, in theory, have uh, real-time automated uh, machine refereeing of a World Cup soccer game and get the human out of the loop. But would you want to watch that soccer game? You know, it, it isn't gaming the system, isn't the, the human fallibility of the referee an essential and necessary part of the game? And do we want to have perfect enforcement of the law? I mean, isn't the law ideally in a perfect society, uh, not perfectly enforced, mm -hmm. if, you hear, if, if you see what I mean. And, and is, this, is this a useful metaphor in discussing automated refereeing of society, as it were? I think it's an interesting metaphor, but I don't think it's necessarily the only one in that there are a lot of sports where we have allowed machines to take over. Any sports that require timing, you know, machines now call the time, and it's not a human being necessarily with thing. They have like auto races and stuff like that are pretty automated. And I think people like the fact that they're, and I think part of it is sort of an evolution of, of, our, of our norms. Um, but uh, I don't know if you, if you have thoughts yeah, I'll, on that. I'm wondering if also that the, sometimes when the machines are not well designed, then we go back to, you know, there's this human thing that, you know, that the machine is not really capturing. But I think as machines get better and better, then in a way we can no longer say that. We, we have, you know, maybe we'll say, you know, if it's a person with a hel helmet versus a person without a helmet, we flip a coin, you know, and the machines can flip coins very fast. You know, they can generate random numbers and, and maybe that's what society would end up deciding because we, and, and actually in some of our surveys, a uh, certain number of, in one of the surveys we, we ask people, you know, should the car swerve or stay or would you flip a coin? And about 25% of people said flip a coin. And in a way there, they were happy, they were more comfortable with fate, right, deciding, and that may well be the, what we decide to do. But I think uh, now we have to choose, you know, if, including the choice of choosing randomly. Right? And, and, yeah. So that's, that's what I mean. Yeah. And then one, one example a story to not pull, suck back in again, but there was a distributed autonomous organization, the um, Ethereum, Bitcoin-like thing, based thing, which was interesting because it was a, a fund where they were selling these coins that turned into investments in the fund, and they announced that the um, fund, the code of the fund, was the entirety of the agreement. There was no legal agreement, and that the code will be done. And um, people bought the coin, invested, and then uh, somebody found an exploit, and they started draining. They raised $150 million, just started draining $50 million. And people were sitting there watching, but they couldn't do anything about it because there was no court to take it to. There was no jurisdiction, there was no agreement. And so what's interesting about that is that in every X number of lines of code, there's always a bug. And you can exploit the bug. And if the bug is the entire, if that code is the entirety of the law, the law becomes fallible in a new way. And in human court, you can go and say, that's not what I meant. And if you agree, you can change it. But in machine land, at least in the current version of what we're calling smart contracts, you can't do that. So, so there's an argument that that's completely never going to work. And, and Bruce and I have talked about that. Having said that, I just talked to some of the probabilistic programming guys at MIT who are working on ways to create these sorts of systems where you just tell it 
kind of the general idea. So what's the goal? And then the AI then tries to, so you, so you can appeal to a machine and say, there may have been a bug, but that's not what we meant when we got here. And the machine would say, all right, let me look at the conversation. No, you're right. You're right. In fact, the mach- this code isn't operating as publicized. We'll, we'll roll it back. And so there may be, like, uh, like he had saying, you know, layers upon layers where we find a hole, but maybe there's a machine that fixes it. But it's going to be an interesting thing. And I think the role of law in, and code as they sort of intermingle is going to be an, an interesting one. Uh, my name is Yazo. I'm a fellow of the Berkman Center. And uh, I was wondering uh, about a similar story that I, I believe in Brazil. Uh, there was certain train stations where we had too, main, too many suicide attempts. And the, the regulation was to kill the, the, the person that was trying to suicide himself to save the lives of people inside the train. So we had... Yeah, really, because... The, the driver need to make a choice, and the regulations, the the the, the rule was to kill the the suicide person, and then uh, someone came up with uh, an idea to surround these stations with uh, transparent glass and resistant glass, and there was not uh, any kind of suicide attempt anymore. So uh, some designers may say that when you uh, don't find a solution for a problem you may uh, be looking for the, the wrong pro- problem. So don't you think that uh, with this interaction and all this new environment where we are mixed with these platforms of artificial intelligence, we are going to find other solutions than laws and regulations? I, I, I mean, I, I agree. I think we, we, I hope we will, but I think that it's not obvious that you know, we, I don't think we're going to stumble on the solution immediately without without having a mechanism for looking for solutions. So you know, even with the case of somebody decide, you know, suggesting that we put you know, let's put glass and you know, the door opens only you know, is aligned with the door of the train, then I'm I'm going to bet that this took a while. Even a simple idea like this took a while for somebody to think about it. Now, what if the solution is some piece of code in the bowels of a deep learning algorithm? Uh, that's not going to be easy to come by unless we have a way of sort of interrogating and auditing those systems. But if they remain black boxes, and we, we, we may never know that there is a counterfactual world in which you know, this is avoidable or this trade-off is, you know, can be resolved differently. Um, do you want to add? Yeah, and I, I, I would think about um, Danella Meadows, uh, uh, who was a, a, a system dynamics person from... Uh, the, yesteryear, um, but she, what, she has this great stack of 12 different ways to intervene in complex self-adaptive systems, starting with the least effective, which is fiddling with the data, or the, or the, the parameters, and then she goes changing the rules, and then she has changing the goals, and then she has changing the paradigm, and so what's interesting about these systems are fairly complex adaptive systems, and so so there's a higher level thing, which is, you know, should I be traveling anyway? You know, um, um, are, are, you know, is fun to drive a thing that we should aspire for as people? You know, w- w- or you know, is capitalism good or bad? You know, so, so, so there, there are these really interesting things where as society starts to evolve, and let's say we get to a point of, you know, th- again, I'm not necessarily um, supporting it, but just one of the ideas that people are talking about is universal basic income. If we get and meet a certain basic material need for everyone. What is, what be, what is the nature of work? Um, how should we rethink who we are and what we are? Because I think one of the problems that a lot of these companies do is they go in and say, assuming cities are still the same, let's try to optimize cities. Let's make traffic lights more efficient. Let's, but everyone's doing the same thing, but let's just make it more efficient is a very low-level intervention. When I think a lot of the things we need to do are high level, and then the high level stuff is actually above the law, and it's above, um, you know, but but it's also very ab- gets a little bit abstract. Yeah. Hi, hi. My name is Paula Villarreal, and I'm a fellow at the Berkman Center. I have two questions. Uh, what are the assumptions you are now challenging? Like, what, what do what do we need to buy, to build a car that goes full speed instead of building a car that is driving at the speed that allows it to, to break in all the scenarios, and, or maybe to reduce harm. And the second is, um, where are the accountability mechanisms mechanism, uh, embedded in the engineering processes mm-hmm. in this? 
Well, I think, uh, <clears throat> I mean, to answer the first question, I think there are, there are trade-offs. You know, like even today, with, without autonomous cars, I'm sure we can, uh, dim, you know, reduce, um, uh, eliminate a vast majority of accidents if everybody drives, for, you know, on 10 miles an hour everywhere, right? And I, I bet that this is not going to be a popular solution, right? And so society is kind of comfortable, you know, that, with... That's precisely an assumption that, uh, and we're not challenging it. Like maybe, why, do, why don't we... Or we can ban cars completely, right? Like then there will be no car accidents. So I think, I think the point is that, um, that as a society, we, we, we have, diff, you know, our thresholds change, you know, and, and whatever rules we have now is the result of kind of some negotiated outcome, you know, uh, th that, you know, car companies, people who want to get to work on time, uh, economic efficiency obviously would suffer, uh, but safety would increase. And, and where, where is the sweet spot there is something that is not obvious a priori. So what societies do is they experiment with, with regulations, they experiment with, with rules, they look at what other countries are doing. And, uh, and this happens to be the equilibrium now, but it's not by no means the, the final word, right? Maybe if somebody, people discover that in school zones, you need a different speed limit, right? And then maybe somebody else will discover something else again. And I think that's the kind of system that I think is important. Now, how do we, how do we bring this kind of experimentation into systems that are much more opaque and in which the actors that are acting autonomously and learning and adjusting are no longer just people that we can put in jail and punish and, and interrogate, but they're machines that are opaque and that, you know, for which we have no interfaces. I, I do think some of that change is emergent. So um, it's hard to force somebody to change with an external intervention, but th there's just this random story I heard about LA these days, which I found interesting, because the traffic has gotten so horrible, but things are so expensive that people have, and now that you have like wireless, people have been building these humongous cars where the inside, they have a driver and the inside is just an office. And they're living really far away, it takes them two hours to get in, doesn't matter because now they are fully functional in the car, right? So, so that's a weird adaptation to an environmental system. And I don't know how many people it is, but, but you could imagine that with self-driving cars, I, like I, I have a Tesla, I realize that I no longer am like stuck to the fast lane anymore. I just, I have less stress, and I actually would rather not drive too fast and let the car just kind of move along. And, you know, I'm, it, it's weird because, you know, you're getting into partial attention. There's other problems. But, but, I, but, but I'm not sitting there trying to optimize my speed anymore. I'm more relaxed. I don't care as much. So, so I think your behavior changes as the systems change. And it could be with autonomous cars, you, you won't care as much driving slowly because you might be having meetings in the cars or something like that. So, so I, th I think it'll be interesting to see. And I think there's some of these are market driven, like with electric vehicles, for instance, the, 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 the system was staunchly against electric vehicles when the EV1 and others came out. But it was when the Japanese electric vehicles came out in the market just said, oh, we like these. And then the regulations just all changed because business wanted to do it. But when they were trying to mandate these laws early on in California, they were just completely uh, uh, overthrown because the dealers thought that they wouldn't make any money. So, so it's interesting to think about how um, now I'm shifting onto the norms of market side is some of these solutions. I, I do think that, that if, we, if people feel it's, it, it makes sense, I think it will happen. Hi, uh, thank you for my, your time. Uh, my name is Griff. I'm a, a Berkman Klein fellow. I work with Peer to Peer University. And I've uh, been subscribing to Car and Driver magazine on and off since I was three. And uh, the reaction there, uh, you know, is, is very lackluster about, you know, uh, autonomous vehicles, and it's obviously a very specific community. But when I sort of reflect on the ways that autonomous vehicles have entered my life in the last five or six years, it's, it's, there's a lot of sort of top down me being told that it's something I should want, um, but I'm curious in your reflections and maybe the work you've done with uh, the Moral Machine will shed some light on this, is you know, what consumer groups do you see really pushing for this and in different societies or different communities do you see it maybe being advocated for in different ways, you know, trading my personal car in for an autonomous vehicle versus thinking about ride sharing as an opportunity and if you could just share a little bit from the perspective of consumers and what you've seen, I'd, I'd love to hear about that. I must say, we, we haven't really run any sort of consumer surveys on like alternative modes. We have, we have been hearing a lot of, especially from people who think this, the question is irrelevant, uh, there are lots of groups that basically want to revamp the entire transportation system. So they think this will be irrelevant because we won't have cars with people on the streets. We won't have streets with, you know, where people are next to cars in the first place. It's all going to be, you know, uh, 
self-driving, uh, dedicated roads, um, or elevated roads, or something like that. Um, so I think there's people who would just basically dismiss, think we should revamp the whole thing. And there's a big economics, you know, uh, the economics of it is very challenging, I think. Um, then you have the petrol heads who, you know, watch Top Gear and want, want to keep their cars. And the question is, whether, will they just drive around in circles one day, you know, in, a, um, in an arena? Or, or will they be actually, uh, will they still have a chance to drive around in the real world? I don't think we, no one has, has an answer, you know, will the change be gradual or not? I think it's, a, it's, it's not uh, just a sociological question, it's an economic question, it's a technical question. Will the technology be fast enough? Will it be affordable? Will, they, will it be fleets you know, or versus uh, consumer owned? I must say that I'm not an expert on these, on these questions, um, but uh, you know, given that this is a likely scenario, which is kind of partial transition where, where you, you're going to have mixed, uh, you, know, people will, you can't just take people's cars away from them, um, I think um, we're going to have to deal with this problem for a while of, of mixed environment, and this is where this question but arises. We have a lot of history, though. I mean, I, I think, you know, tobacco ads, I still remember them, but you don't see them anymore and no one misses them. You know, I think that's going to be the same with fun-to-drive ads. You know, it's be, you know, in, in, in you know, auto, automobile magazines are going to be like gun and ammo magazines. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, it will be, because I think when you connect it to deaths, so I think the problem with the tobacco industry is they had this whole fight against this you're killing people thing. And I think that if we get, let's say, a community, let's say you take California and they go all self-driving in a couple of communities and you see traffic accident death going to zero, you know, just like with drunk driving, when, when there was indisputable evidence that drunk driving caused deaths, you just couldn't argue that it was okay for me to have a couple of martinis and hop in the car. It just seemed like the wrong thing to do. And so, and, and, I, and I jokingly say this, but like, can you imagine if, because if, right now a million people, a million three people die from traffic accident deaths a year in the world, right? And so if you said, well, you know, but I have the right, like the second amendment, to drive my own car and I love to have fun to drive at the expense a, of a million. Uh, and we have a drunk driver magazine as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but I, think, I think it becomes harder to make that argument. I think right now it's theoretical. Just like the tobacco stuff and the drunk driving stuff seem theoretical. And I think that, that and, and, and I think Lessig teaches, used to teach a course on this too, where you see this kind of the norms and the laws go from, of, of course women shouldn't vote, or of course we sh not everyone is equal to, that. how could we have thought that before? And there's this really interesting pivot that you make. And I kind of feel like with, 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 with these systems, as they get deployed, we'll, we'll, we'll hit that point. So we have a question on Twitter from uh, one of our affiliates, Malavika Jairam. Um, we've talked about um, ethics and morality in specific ways. Um, her question is more along the lines of the morality or ethics of gamifying moral decision making. Um, did y'all <laughs> comment on that? That's the morality of your work, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I think, uh, I think it's a good question. You know, the, 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 the question is, uh, is it okay to, you know, have people play, you know, I mean, so we never call this a game, but, you know, suppose, you know, people choosing uh, as a form of entertainment, let's say, you know, who should live and who should die, and whether people are taking this question seriously enough. Um, well, I think, uh, obviously, if this is how it's used, you know, that it, if, for me, like, if the entertainment that, let's say this is entertainment for some people, right? Um, and if that happens to produce an outcome that is that is superior, then I'm all for for entertainment. You know, there are people who uh, play games, and as a result, they solve protein folding problems. You know, that's okay. That's that's that doesn't diminish from the science. So I think as long as we don't take it too seriously, a priori, as long as we don't sort of um, rely on votes as something that we're just going to take. Uh, you know, from online, maybe there are trolls, people who are just kind of playing to kill more people and, you know, in the modern machine, just for the heck of it, as long as we don't take that too seriously and put it straight into code, you know, this is why I think we need, we need filters and, and this is just one part of a very broad conversation that involves legislators, car makers, uh, uh, you know, and, and other stakeholders in society. So for me, this is just one piece of the puzzle it helps us understand people's perceptions, including you know, who, who are the jerks, who, who don't take this seriously, or who have you know, skewed ethics. Um, so for me, uh, 
the fact that it looks uh, simple is actually uh, the, the advantage there is that uh, it can engage a broad group of people. You know, we can we can actually uh, collect data from uh, people who are not technical, and they can still have a way to engage with this topic to recognize that it's you know the rule that I use in the first scenario where I said you know let's save more people. Now the more people are breaking the law. You know it's not simple as simple as that. Or now there's there's children involved. You know should, should I take that into account? So this simply I think having people engage in this topic and the majority I think are would 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 take it seriously. You know uh, just just appreciating that this is not an easy problem and that it cannot be solved only by car makers, uh, but also requires uh, you know broader discussion. For me is is an advantage. So maybe one last question yep. to Choi, if I may. Um, you wrote the book, as I said in my introduction, that um, makes us think about the ways we can deal with this faster future. You also pointed out at the beginning of the talk uh, that some of these technologies are already here and are widely adopted. And to your point, however, describing that uh, this co-evolutionary mechanism between society and technology is full of challenges at, at, various, at various layers. How much time do we have to figure it out, mm -hmm. uh, the things we discussed today? What's our so, timeline here? So, so I think it's like the climate. I, don't, I think it's already too late. So I think um, with privacy and with climate, I think we're going to sustain substantial damage, um, even if we do everything we can. And I think that even just looking at the judiciary system, I mean, it's deployed. Um, Julia writes this article where nothing happened. You know, it's kind of like you can sit there and describe exactly how it's broken and nothing happens, you know. And so, so I'm very concerned that we're too late in preventing anything from happening. It's already going to be a train wreck. And I think that what we need to do is... So there's a couple of key things for me, just like in climate, I think there's key things. I think one thing is you want to attack these things before they gain a tremendous amount of financial power to develop into a lobby. So for instance, the, uh, the, the AI um, risk scoring companies, they're being funded by foundations that are trying to do the right thing. And it's possible that some version of what they do may be the right thing, but there isn't really, I mean, but they're small enough now that they don't have a lobby. But if they got as big as, say, guns and the NRA, it gets much harder to di displace them. So what I think is important is to sort of figure out where we have broken systems, uh, go in and try to point them out, come up with solutions and attack them, at least atta attack them, try to fix them um, before they become cancerous. And so cancerous systems, I, I think, are systems that no longer are able to be held back through our self-regulatory immune system, which should be our legislature, should be our judiciary, which are dysfunctional at suppressing these things, partially because these new cancers that we have work in patterns that these legislatures and these enforcement systems aren't very well equipped to identify those. Um, and so part of this bringing the engineers into the conversation helps us create these patterns. But it really, if you, I think the sort of biological metaphor is where we're, we're about to be infected with a whole new category of pathogen. Um, that can sometimes be turned in our favor, t turned into f favorable microbes. But I think we're, we're going to sustain a tremendous amount of damage. And so, um, so, so but, the, but, but, I, but I think having said that, it's not too late to prevent an extinction event, but I think it's too late to prevent a whole bunch of damage. On this semi-pessimistic <laughs> note, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.